The History Things Podcast is brought to you by TR Historical, your one-stop shop for all your historical fan gear needs. Visit trhistorical.com and use the promo code HISTORYTHINGS to receive 10% off your next purchase. Thanks for listening. Now let's start the show. Are you ready? What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the History Things Podcast. I am your co-host, Pat McGuire. Joining me, as always, is my co-host with the most. Ladies and gentlemen, you know and you love him. Author, historian, thrice published uh, author now. We forgot to keep harping on that. Thrice. We keep. We can't say that word enough. It's fancy. You just like the word. I do. I also love the band. Uh, but there's three books that you got out. You are also a park ranger at our top secret site, because remember, we can't talk about that. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show here at the end of season three, Matt Borders. How you doing, buddy? Doing good, Pat. How's it going? It's going all right, man. I'm ready to uh, take a little bit of time off here at the end of the season. We've been crushing it. This has been a very busy summer. I'm ready to close on a high note. You're heading out of town soon, too, right? Yeah, at the time of this recording, I'm heading out of town. <laughs> I mean, we're recording this in July, so just a sort of production lie. We're talking like it's the end of the year. It's really July, and uh, we're, we're rangers that are just midsummer gassed, and I'm going to get a random break that most rangers don't get. So I'm very grateful uh, <laughs> for the PTO schedule in the Maryland State Park system. Uh, yeah, I'm going to head down to Hatteras soon. So, uh, you know, I well, I guess well, since we broke the fourth wall, and it's really July in this conversation, Matt, the uh, the season going well at Monocacy. Battle anniversary is still ahead of us right now. Yep, we are just about a week out. It's going to be a good time. We've got uh, special events planned, obviously, for ranger-led programs, battlefield tours, and uh, historic weapons demonstrations. So. so obviously by the time you're listening, you had a great time at all these events. And Absolutely. And spoiler, and everything was safe, and it went off without and a hitch. Spoiler, <laughs> if you didn't know, uh, the uh, Jubilee Early did not actually successfully get to Washington. So wah, wah. spoiler, it doesn't work out for them. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we're very excited. Like we said, this is for our quarter four episode to uh, close on a high note. Uh, we have a guest in studio today. I'm very pumped to have somebody sitting in our awesome War Department Studios. We, uh, we've we spent a lot of time on Zoom this season yep. uh, talking to people from far, far away. Uh, our guest today has sort of popped into our life uh, serendipitously. Uh, we've known each other or known about each other, as a lot of us do, uh, in the history circles locally to the Maryland, D.C. area. Uh, but only a few short weeks ago at uh, Fort Frederick Market Fair, did Mr. Dana Shove come walking into my life? Mm-hmm. Walking uh, into your fort. Walking into right. my fort. So welcome to our show, Dana. Dana is the managing editor of print for History Net and the Civil War Times Magazine. You are the editor. You are the big cheese editor of that one, right? Yes, I'm the top editor for Civil War Times Magazine. Right? Welcome yeah, to the show, yeah. bud. Yeah, it was pretty crazy at Fort Frederick because I was out there uh, in the capacity because we, we publish nine history magazines at History Net. And so... I went to the Fort Frederick Market Fair to do some video for American History magazine and put it on their Facebook page. And I just saw this interpreter and I said, let's go talk to this guy. Yeah. And it was Pat. And, and he was like, so, oh, sh-. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I said, hey, would you mind? And Pat said, I know who you are. And I was a little thrown. And then we had a great conversation. I love Fort Frederick. I... um. I went there first when I was like re- really pretty young, you know, because mm-hmm. it wasn't all that far from where I grew up in Western Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. and um, I always thought it was such a cool fort and such a cool location. So it is that you I, grabbed the one uh, living history interpreter out there for 18th century with a beard too. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> well, he explained the beard. I talk about it all the time. I say, <laughs> look, I'm a 21st beard. century person. He um, explained a beard, but <laughs> yeah, no, it's cool. A cool place, and I think it's pretty cool you're out there. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm privileged to work out there. Listen, as one extremely famous person to another oh, extremely yeah. famous uh, person. <laughs> wait a minute. Dana. Uh, is there someone else in the room? <laughs> no, no. But no. I'm not talking about me. I heard no. you a minute ago say it, it kind of throws you when somebody recognizes you. Yeah. I just got this recently at the fort. It's kind of like humblingly weird, isn't it? When like somebody like, it oh, is. thanks yeah. for recognizing me. And then you're like, no. I'm well, not worthy. I'm not worthy. No, it's, a, it's an odd feeling because uh, we do a lot of broadcasts 
on our Civil War Times Facebook page. Mm. Right. We call them First Monday Broadcast. We were just at Gettysburg doing stuff. And so, yeah, I mean, people see me on those, and, you know, I am a tiny, 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 tiny fish, you know. But it, I've, ha- I've gone places, and people have come up and said, hey, Dana, and I, you know, and they're like, oh, I saw you on your thing, and I went to this place because you did talk about it, which <laughs> is, for me, that's the greatest feeling. Not yeah. that they recognize me, but, like, they went to the Gibbs Battery location on uh, Little Round Top, where right. most people yes. don't go, and I went there and said, you should come here because no one goes here. And they go there, and they're like, it's cool, you know? So uh, that really makes me feel good that people are going out and appreciating history, you know, based on what I've explained and they're you know well, listening, I, so. I knew you were going to be cool people because our good buddy rich condon only knows cool people and i That's saw true. once upon yeah. a time way back that i was like oh like when i linked up with rich i was like oh you all are linked and i was like hey if rich knows you you got to be right kind of awesome sauce well, i have rich... just a little veneer of cool because i know rich That's yeah <laughs> well he, we i now refer to him as the rich condon because oh as you should yes. he uh always pops up on our broadcasts on facebook and yeah. says oh well you know when it's when it's cold up here he's always like Oh, it's like 65 here now i'm like how is it now rich like the you know the uh it's 165 it's humid yeah, it's 165 right. and the crabs are trying to eat you so yeah. uh but uh yeah we every coast he's like hey rich condon here i'm like the rich condon because the you know rich. he's the rich condon and let's if he ever hears this rich oh he does get, he's a big listener let's of just get this <laughs> huge out. fan you know you know you want back up here Yes, you he know. knows. He does. He knows. You it. know you want back up here oh, close he's, to your he's homeland. He's been killing it, though, down there. Oh, no. Um, he's doing... Well, you know, he's taking a park that is relatively new and no one heard of, and right. he's really given us some excellent press. And Absolutely. Some pretty, pretty cool stories. And some very good interpretive programming yeah, down there. He, ju- he just got a big award, actually, from NPS I, for that. Oh, yeah. Really well, good. now we're going to have to have him back on the well, show. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Jesus. All yeah. right, coming soon. Rich Condon. He doesn't even know <laughs> The yet, return. But right. he's going to have to come back. <laughs> the, so. ri- the Rich Condon. The Rich Condon yeah. shall return. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, that was kind of uh, when I met you at Fort Frederick, right. I, I only had the association of you being associated with Civil War Times magazine. Right. So I was, you know, pleasantly surprised to learn about your uh, overseeing of a lot of other publications. So what are, uh, what are some of the publications that people out there might recognize that are under the umbrella? Uh, I'm going to probably forget one, but let's try. So we have World War II history, aviation history, Vietnam history, American history, uh, Wild West, Civil War times, and we have a second Civil War magazine called America's Civil War magazine. We can talk Mm. about that a little bit if you want. Yeah. And, um, oh boy, what am I forgetting? So... Oh, Civil... Military History Magazine Ooh. and Military History Quarterly Magazine. That is a great magazine. So those are the two. Those are, that's the stable of publications. And I only became managing editor of print this past January or February All right. of uh, 2022. Private, previous to that, I was the editor of Civil War Times. And so, you know, we're a very small company. A very small number of people put out all those magazines. So I sort of have this hybrid role. And I share that management with a managing editor of digital, okay. which, you know, is because we have we have a website, historynet.com. Check it out. And you can subscribe to, any, subscribe to any of our magazines there. We have a very active Facebook page for Civil War Times. You can find that very easily. And all the other magazines have Facebook pages as well. Hmm. So um, it's a very small company. And like I said, you know, it's just I have this hybrid role of trying to oversee um, some of the operations, you know, the print operations and and then the magazine itself. We publish quarterly, four times a year, all of our magazines. And, you know, uh, we still have a lot of subscribers, you know. I mean, I know print magazines are, it's not a growth industry, <laughs> but, uh, you know, history people um, seem to like a tangible connection yeah. to their interest and enthusiasm. So we... You know, most of our readers are older in the sense, you know, they're fifties or but we're getting more young readers and uh we're you know we're pleased with that. And uh if, you know, people pick up the magazines, there's there's cool stuff in them. Really, we don't we try not to rehash stuff. We always try to go after new, fresh stuff. And I give all the editors in the group great credit for that. 
And it's hard, especially with the Civil War, man. It is mm-hmm. well plowed ground. It is very. And so it's it takes some effort to uh, especially in July come up with some new <laughs> twists on stuff. But you know what's amazing? There there are new things out there, you know. And that's one of the reasons I like to run primary source materials because yeah. every soldier's Civil War is different, you know. And so we run letters and diaries a lot. We have a repeat theme feature called the War in Their Words, and uh, so that gives people you know, a fresh perspective. And I just like to introduce that sort of stuff to a wide audience. Absolutely. I'm going through this right now. I'm reading Joseph Plum Martin. Yes. And uh, Mm -hmm. prior to this, I thought that the Continental Army had the same experiences of every other army. And like, you know, they they were decently, they weren't the best supplied and all this stuff. I'm coming to find that Joseph Plum Martin's book should have really been called, Here's What We Were Supposed to Eat. Yeah, and here's what I wanted to eat, <laughs> right. and here's what I actually got to eat. Right, and like it's awful. So. It's, it's some of I, it's cringeworthy at points, you know. But the individual level of like his experience differs from somebody next to exactly. them. Like like some soldiers talk about how overstuffed they are, and I'm like, right. that's so wild right. that this dude is like, yeah. bitching about the substance he's getting, and yeah. other people are like I have too much. Yeah, like, I don't understand how that you're fighting in the same war. I know. So. No, it's it's. Uh... It's interesting when you dig down into that sort of that grassroots level and, you know, see what's going on. It's, you know, like some of the stuff we're going to talk about a little bit today. Yeah, you know, when you, you, you look at these armies sometimes in this big homogenous sense, right? And, and you know, here's this big, in, you know, using the Civil War, big group of blue guys and big group of gray guys. You start drilling down and it's like you wonder how they were able to execute anything because of the, some of the stuff going on in these regiments, you know? Absolutely. Uh, well, that was a perfect segue because I am ready to talk about today's topic. Uh, we can get back into uh, History Net and its uh, under umbrella uh, publications because I do uh, have some quick questions about that. But, okay. um, but I want to get into what we're here for today sure. because that was such a good handoff. Um, normally here on the show, uh, I, we've, we've learned this through some of the, the emails we randomly get here, that um, when I ask some of the obvious questions, some people don't realize that I'm asking them because sometimes we need to walk through a conversation right. a certain way. Yeah, yeah. And it kind of comes off like I don't know something. It's like somebody's like, how is this dude hosting a podcast? It's like, listen, man, not everybody listening to the show is in like, you know, advanced AP history. Sometimes we're still in 101. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. So, so I got to ask some of those questions today. I am going to be asking a question that I okay. legitimately know nothing about. This is not one of those setups, so we can walk it through. So today, we are here to talk about Erastus B. Tyler, right? Uh, and so, my questions to you, Dana, are why? Okay, <laughs> and um, what is what about him? What about his story is so worth? telling in a sea of millions right. of stories worth telling. So okay. Erastus B. Tyler, Dana Shove. So Erastus B. Tyler, and I would suspect the vast majority of the listeners out there have no idea who this fellow is, was a colonel and then a brigadier general in the Union Army. And um, one of the things that I sort of find myself maybe subconsciously drifting to is the stories of people that aren't as popular, right? <laughs> so one of my little kicks I've just started on is, is looking at um, Pennsylvania regiments number 200 and up. Whoa. Be- because no one has really looked at those regiments, and they weren't at battles like Gettysburg and stuff. And I know I'm going down a rabbit hole here, but some of those regiments fought heavily at Petersburg, for example, right? Mm-hmm. And got chopped up pretty bad. So, you know, you start looking at these unlooked at things, and you find some interesting stories. So... Erastus B. Tyler came into my life, if you will, years and years and years ago. Let me see if I can. Yeah. Okay. I'm looking at a term paper I wrote when I was in graduate school at Kent State University. Okay. For a seminar. I'm a failed doctoral student. I never finished my PhD. Boo. So I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm just are kidding. you booing the PhD or the fact I didn't get it? No, I'm booing that you're still time. Go back. Go back. Go back. Okay. You're not failed. You're not oh, failed. Oh, oh, okay. So um, first attempt in learning. That's yeah, a failure. Right, right. If you're out there listening, yeah, <laughs> it's okay. So I I I was living in a town called Ravenna, Ohio, and so I'm looking around for stuff to write about and research for my seminar paper, and I got interested in the Seventh Ohio Volunteer Infantry, which had some companies raised out of Portage County, which mm-hmm. is where I was living, and so I'm like, oh, okay, you know, Seventh Ohio, and I'm like, in their first colonel is a guy named Erastus B. Tyler. And I was like, oh, so I started poking around about him a little bit, and I was renting a house, which was a 1830s house, actually. I was renting a back room in this house, 
And Tyler's house was on the same street. It was no longer there. Okay. And I'm like, whoa, this guy lived across the street from where I live. And so I just started looking and doing research and general information. And then I found out that in April and May of 1861, Tyler had contested James Garfield for the colonelcy of the 7th Ohio. Whoa. Okay. So at, at the time, and this is going to get reformed later in the war, the enlisted men and the officers in a regiment were allowed to vote or elect their colonel, okay? Right. So, in essence, what happened, and we'll come back to this, is that they voted for Tyler over Garfield, okay? So, we'll get there, but a little bit about Garfield, uh, excuse me, Tyler's background. So, Tyler was born in 1819 in New York State, and when he was a young kid, his family moved to Ravenna, and his dad had a store there. And somehow, um, you know, well, not somehow, I mean, uh, Erastus follows suit and he will work in the store and then he will get involved in the fur trade, mm. which I think is unusual. When you look at a lot of men who became officers in the Civil War on both sides, they're sort of, you know, they're military school graduates, right? Or they're attorneys. Right, a or lot of lawyers, yeah, a lot of lawyers, <laughs> or they're involved in infrastructure, like they're, you know, working on railroads, you know, new, in, yeah, or they're yeah, indus- yeah. industrial. Yeah. Tyler gets into the fur trade. Hmm. Okay, he opens up a hat store in Ravenna, which I am sure led to this fur trade thing because hats were often made out of fur at the time. Sure. And he will spend time traveling around West Virginia. I don't think he's actually trapping himself. <laughs> right? But he's w- going and interacting with fur trappers and bringing back these furs. And he also becomes an agent for the American Fur Company. So he's got, you know, sort of a, dare I say, sort of blue collar kind of yeah. job, right? You know, this is not, you know, an attorney, obviously. So anyway, that's how he kind of makes his wealth. <laughs> And he runs this store, and he gets involved in the local militia. And he will rise in rank, become brigadier general of, I forget the division, in the Ohio militia. So when the war breaks out, like a lot of men of a certain age, right, he's like, I want to become an officer because this war is going to be short, and it's, I want to take advantage of it and, and have some status out of it. And so he will begin to give patriotic speeches in Ravenna. Hmm. And there are a number, a couple companies in, his, in the militia that will al- almost automatically kind of like um, follow suit and say, we'll be in whatever regiment you raise, okay? And one of those companies actually names itself the Tyler Guards after him. Okay? Oh, wow. Sweet. And I believe they become Company G of the 7th Ohio, hmm. Okay. So, and then Garfield is from that general area of Ohio as well, okay? And he comes back, he's in uh, a Columbus, he's a state senator, and he comes back, and he gets involved in sort of campaigning around. And what's interesting is Garfield goes around the county and the neighboring counties sort of campaigning, right, giving speeches, and Tyler gives a few speeches, but he more or less what I call goes to work and sets up and works in a recruiting office. Hmm. Okay, so he's actually signing these guys up. Oh, he's doing the job before he's given the job. He's doing the job, right. Yeah. And so he gets a lot of, you know, favoritism for that. And then they, Garfield is ordered away by the then governor of Ohio, William Dennison, who says, we don't have enough muskets for these troops that we're raising for the Ohio quota. Will you go to Indiana and try to find some muskets? So he sends Garfield on a mission to go out and, you know, procure some muskets. Mm. And while Garfield's away, the men of the 7th hold this impromptu election in which they elect Tyler as the colonel. So Garfield comes back, and it wasn't an official election. It was just sort of a, let's do this. Yeah, amongst the men. Amongst the men. He's really upset. He's betrayed. He's betrayed. He's betrayed. And so, you know, there's a lot of furor over this, and it's reflected in the local papers because the Portage County 
Sentinel favors Tyler. It's the Democratic paper. And the Portage County Democrat, despite the name, is a Republican Party mouthpiece, basically. Hmm. And these two very strident mouthpieces for these various parties treat it like a political contest, is what they treat it like. You know, in a, and you know, one is touting Garfield, one is touting Tyler. I've not seen anything, and I haven't studied regimental elections, I haven't seen anything quite like this hmm. in other cases, you know, where it becomes almost this political football in this county. I mean, this seems very large scale, because we definitely have this all over the war in early, yeah, in the yeah. early phases of the war, but like, I don't think I can recall a single time where it's like, this is on 11. These guys are, these guys no. are giving big stump speeches. <laughs> they, and like... <laughs> they have turned to 11. They, they've turned this to 11. Absolutely. And so they are eventually, they go to Cleveland to begin to organize the regiment, and then it goes to um, Columbus. They're sent to Columbus mm. to final, finally organize the regiment. And it is in Columbus where this official vote is taken, and Tyler is triumphant again. He's going to be the colonel of the regiment. Officially. 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 And Garfield sort of goes ballistic. And he, <laughs> he claims that there were voting irregularities. And how could he have lost the election? Because he's so popular. <laughs> and he was a state senator. <laughs> and how could this be? And there must be something fishy went on with the poll books. Oh, Funny old world. <laughs> Let's look at the poll books and see if the poll books were tampered with. I've never heard this story before, Dana, yeah, ever no. in my life. Right. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, it's odd. Right? It's odd. And so basically, uh, the newspapers in uh, Portage County really crank it up at this time. And they're screaming at each other about impropriety and stuff. And um, the guy's name slips my mind, but he um, was a good friend of Garfield, and he was defending him publicly, but he wrote him a letter and said, just let this drop, <laughs> because you're going to hurt your political chances. Just let this drop and, and, and go another route here. So Garfield does eventually let it drop, and he goes to um, William Dennison, who is governor till 62, I think, in Ohio, and says, you know, I want a regiment. And Dennison says, okay, but you're going to have to raise it. Right. And so he goes out and he raises, I believe, the 42nd Ohio. And um, now in Garfield's defense, because we're going to leave him for a while at least, he does a good job. You know, he will rise to Brigadier General himself. And uh, the men of the 42nd seem to respect him. They're sent to Kentucky, and they do these things, you know, out west. Um, but, yeah, he, he looked really sort of grasping for a while when he didn't win this election, I have to say. A little aside here, <laughs> as, a, as a young graduate student years ago, uh, I did this paper, and, you know, somehow somebody found out about it. So I got invited to come speak about it. Um, at, and I can't remember if, what the function was for. Okay. But I drive, you know, to this, this, uh, little town in Ohio in, in, um, I think it was in Portage County or Summit County, the next one over. And I pull up in front of the James Abram Garfield high school, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, Oh, Great. That's interesting. Great, yeah. right? So I walk did, in and it's... Didn't have Google to warn no, you. No, <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's the name of their school. So I go in ambush, and... Ambush, ambush. Ambush. And so I walk in and I'm like, uh, you know, I'm like, hi, I'm here to give the talk, you know. <laughs> and uh, so it's like, they're like, you know, oh, great, you know, the, uh, the puny graduate students here. And they're like, here, we'd like you to meet our local Garfield impersonator. So, oh, jeez. So, they're like, oh, this is the worst yeah, night so of my worst, life. It's the worst. <laughs> and so, so this guy, and if you know, uh, actually Garfield and um, Tyler were somewhat similar looking. They are both about six feet tall. Mm -hmm. They were husky guys, right? Mm -hmm. They got some meat I on their bones. feel that. And... Uh, uh, there, yeah, Matt's got a CDV of um, Tyler here, and uh, you know, he's you can tell he's a big guy, yeah. But you know, Garfield was about the same size, he both had this sort of receding hairline, big beard, and so I, this guy, feel that too. true to uh, <laughs> Garfield, uh, in reality, is sort of a, a big husky guy, mm. and like if you had taken off his reproduction. 19th century civilian clothes and slapped a uh, leather 
biker vest on him, he'd have looked right at home in that biker there vest, you go. too. That's right. So he comes over and he shakes my hand, almost breaks it. And I'm like, how you doing, President Garfield? And so <laughs> we sit down and we're having our dinner, you know, the chicken, the rubber chicken dinner, right? Sure. I'm like, you know, I'm like, look, trying to swallow it because I'm like, yeah. you know, the atmosphere. And he turns to me and he says, you're not going to say anything bad about Garfield, are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm going to destroy him. <laughs> and I said, man, I said, well, I said, all I'm going to do is tell you what, oh, what I, you know, what, what I found in the primary sources. So uh, I had to get up and give this talk about this election. And, you know, like this Garfield guy is sitting there staring at me the whole time. <laughs> so it's like really unnerving. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to be in history anymore. You know, yes. so please, but, and, please tell me there was also a painting of Garfield. Yeah, They're just glaring probably, down at you. Probably, <laughs> there had to be in this school, right? I had to walk under some painting oh my in God. this school. So, yeah, it's like, and it's like, I'm like, this is, you know, and then I forgot. So. Garfield actually complains that Tyler stole the election by bargains and brandy. Oh, okay. Because he's handing out booze and he was promising stuff to the captains. Who knows, that's, right? That's very 19th century yeah, politics. Yeah, sure probably did, <laughs> you yeah. know? But, and then one other little thing that I find interesting. This regiment is, has got a lot of Democrats in it, right? The mm. political party Democrats, a lot of these guys. There's one company company c that is put in this regiment from oberlin ohio and if you know anything about oberlin huge abolitionist mm. college at the time very republican right these guys will actually theodore wilder is the uh, author of it they will write their own company history you know regimental histories you've heard of right yeah. wow. they write the history of company c in the great war something like that that's so wild <laughs> because i think they're so like hey were the Republicans in this Democratic regiment, and hmm. you know, they're like they're big in abolition, and the other these guys are here for all the wrong reasons. We're yeah. here for the right reasons. So they write their own little company history, which is uh, reprinted, and you can get a hold of it too. That's you know? cool. Yeah, so that's very cool. Uh, anyway, so the election is held, and Tyler will become colonel. He'll lead the Seventh Ohio uh, into some early engagements in West Virginia. They will be. Uh, the seventh is really roughly handled at the Battle of Kessler's Cross Lanes, mm. where they're surprised. You know, a lot of that early murky West Virginia stuff, these little engagements, as uh, you know, the federal army's trying to secure the borderlands of Ohio, basically. You know, right. they get attacked in their camp, they got Kessler's? attacked in their camp while they were eating breakfast, yeah, yeah. and they got routed. Um, but Garf, uh, excuse me, Tyler managed to get them under control reformed them and they sort of survived it you know right. and then um he is going to lead a brigade that will consist of the seventh during the shenandoah valley fighting mm. and um he he fights well in a a fairly bad campaign for the federals right you know he, right. he serves competently they're heavily engaged at port republic Oh, okay. yeah. And so and so after that, there's some reorganization and kind of fast forwarding a little bit in by May of 1863, he is a brigadier general, Tyler, and he is going to be put in command of a brigade that consists of three nine month regiments mm. and um, one three year regiment, which is the 91st Pennsylvania. And he's going to be brigaded with Peter Albach's brigade, which is, again, they are also all nine-month Pennsylvania regiments. And that's going to be in Andrew Atkinson's Humphreys Division mm -hmm. of the Fifth Corps. So they're going to be Humphreys Division during the battles of uh, Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville. Right. So another little tie-in for me is that my ancestors, my great-grandfather and my great-uncle, will serve in the 134th PA, 9-month regiment, and that's one, of, that's one of the regiments Tyler commanded. Ooh. Yeah, so that was another, like, you know, like, so, whoa. So you're taking orders from yeah. old Tyler here. You're right. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm dedicated to... You're not going to say anything bad about Erastus <laughs> Tyler, are you? <laughs> his, his picture's looking <laughs> yeah. at me right yeah, here. Exactly. <laughs> I'm having flashbacks. I'm having flashbacks. 
it. Well, and they try very hard to make it to Antietam as well. Yes. Uh, they do a really hard forced march from right there in Frederick, pre- basically overnight, marching all night. And, and reach Antietam on the 18th, just after the battle. Yes, that's a good point, and thanks for bringing that up, because, I mean, Humphrey, basically, they marched, I think, a longer distance in a shorter amount of time than Hill's guys, A.P. Hill's guys. And they I get believe no, that's correct. They are the Rodney <clears throat> Dangerfield of the Maryland campaign. They get no respect, because all we talk about is A.P. Hill's force march. Right, and so and so they, they, they book it out of Frederick once they hear about the battle. Humphreys rushes his division, his division there, and I believe that's true. They made mm-hmm. it there in a shorter amount of time with less straggling. Humphreys said there was hardly any straggling. Now, I think some of what's going on is you've got these guys are really new. You right. know, they've just come in. Uh, I said May of '63. I got that wrong. Um, they they come in. That's when they leave the service. Mm-hmm. Oh, they come in in August of '62. Oh, that that's one. that's when that brigade is formed. So I I gave the discharge date. So they've only been in the you know formed up for a few weeks. Welcome to the army, Battle of Antietam. Yep. Yeah. By the time <laughs> that they do this. And um, so they, they camp out on the Grove Farm, actually, is where okay. they're camped uh, at Antietam. And they don't fight at Shepherdstown, but they support the Union artillery on the Maryland side. Mm-hmm. They're moved up to support the federal artillery. And they see, they watch the Battle of Shepherdstown, that another federal sort of not great. Two things real yeah. quick. Same Grove Farm Lincoln visits for the famous photographs? Correct. Correct. Are they there when that happens? Yes. Sweet. And I was just about. <laughs> So Sergeant Harvey Dinsmore, I own one of his letters. He will not survive the war, but he's mm. at the Grove Farm. And he, of course, I'm paraphrasing because I don't have a letter here. He's writing uh, his brother at home, and he said, I wish I could come home and dig taters, but old Abe Lincoln isn't done with us yet. And um, no, he said, no, he said, I wish I could come home and help you cut corn, but old Abe Lincoln ain't done with us digging taters yet. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. And then he said, he said, I saw, he said, well, old Abraham Lincoln paid us a visit the other day. He rides a horse not nearly as good as old Ned back at home. After seeing him, I have half a mind to get me a stovepipe hat and get an old Ned and ride to Washington anyhow. Oh, so he's got a better horse than the president. Thinks yeah. he can do the job, huh? <laughs> Which there's this remarkable small d democ- d- democratic, you know, I saw the president. Right. He doesn't even have, he doesn't ride a horse very well, and our horse at home's even better, yeah. you know? It's not like he's knocking Lincoln, it's, al- it's kind of like, observing. he's observing Lincoln, and there's almost like this, like, he's kind of like us, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. yeah, so that, I thought, was this classic, really interesting quote about him seeing Lincoln. There are, there are a lot of troops who comment on Lincoln kind of awkwardly riding when yes. he visits the army. So yeah. I could, I could totally see that. Yeah, and it, it's just like, it's so cool to see it in this letter. And it's dated Grove Farm, even. It just, oh, that's cool. Oh, yeah. It says, oh, it says really Camp cool. near Sharpsburg. And I forget the date, you know, mm-hmm. in the Grove. It's just really cool. Is this Early unit October. left behind in Frederick to, so when they make this march, right, this mm-hmm. is way better than AP Hill in every possible way march. <laughs> um, when they do Well, they it, don't get engaged like AP yes, Hill. They don't turn yeah. the tide of the battle. Hey, that's look, a good point. I, yeah. You know what? Arguably, they take less casualties than AP Hill <laughs> yeah, does. So. That's, that's what, right. <laughs> that's right, just all I'm saying. But when they do this, they are they... Are they part of the the force left there, or are they arriving in Frederick too late to have departed for the subsequent maneuvers, you know, when McClellan's chasing down these p- uh, repositioned Confederate I'm armies? I'm not as well-versed as others, and you might know, Matt. Matt I'm probably not sure. does know, Mr. Maryland. But I, I believe they were just sort of, like, not left there, but posted there, be, you know, because there's— I mean, they just inherited a bunch of POWs because the Confederates leave a whole bunch of sick behind. You know, it's right. a big hospital already. Yes. And yeah, I, and I think because they're really green, you know, that yeah. that's probably a good reason that they're they're kept back a little bit, too. That, um, keep and, an eye on all these sickies. Yeah. Right, and they're at the end of the line as well. The Fifth Corps is kind of towards the end of the line, and Humphrey's Brigade is the end of the line. Okay. Or, so or that, division, excuse me. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah makes total sense. So, yeah, um... So that's where they are, and then, you know, like the rest of the Army of the Potomac, they, they stay there for a while, and then they're moved down into Virginia during the 
you know, pursuit of Lee that's going to end up at the Battle of Fredericksburg. And yeah. You, wait, you mean the the time McClellan actually gets moving and chases Lee after Antietam? Yeah. That time mm-hmm. we don't talk about? Well, right, because there's been some, <laughs> actually, it's been. He's pulling my leg on that one. <laughs> in, actually, it was a good article in Civil War Times, if I may say so myself, about, uh, and there's been a book by Stephen Stottlemyre mm-hmm. kind of relooking at McClellan. And, you know, McClellan had, according to Stottlemyre, significant supply issues. Very. I and, mean, let's just address this for a minute, since because we never want to we never want to avoid talking about this when we can, because like this, this whole conversation for Matt and I started as an exercise in like when you're hating on somebody so much, like what's the redemptive quality? So right. we tried to do McClellan haters defending McClellan. And we started really talking about the state of what the army looks like immediately after Antietam. And when you combine all the summer long fighting and supply issues they have and this newly combined army and this yeah. really aggressive pursuit, which we don't give them enough credit for, you know, getting out of Washington, catching up to Lee, right. fighting these. When it's all said and done, it's like these guys have outran every supply. They're gassed. Yeah. It's like, what do you want out of that? Like, I know what you want, but like, realistically, what do you want? Like, you, you think that he could just miraculously summon. 100,000 people in the fighting strength. It's like, it's, it, we yeah, don't, it's I, crap. I, I don't think people appreciate, even though things have modernized quite a bit by the time of the Civil War, how long it took to get stuff. I mean, look, look where we are now with the mail being slower mm-hmm. and, you know, and it's still light years ahead of some of the stuff that they're going through. And you have <laughs> to produce, you know, there are still like thousands of women hand sewing uniforms for even in the union army right you right. know there's only so many contractors and arsenals even making uniforms and shoes and they're consuming vast amounts of this stuff and it takes a while to get all that stuff there you don't have computers you're looking at scripts you've got to ride around on horses to go places you have to send mail it takes more time than we realize to, right. to do and and so you know, I have no doubt after that massive battle in 62 and all that fighting they've done, just as the Confederate Army is worn out and yep. low Same on situation. stuff, the Federals are as well. And, you know, if you look at the Army of the Potomac, and I know we're off the Tyler track No, here. that's okay. I don't care. We do rabbit okay. holes here on the podcast. <laughs> I don't care. We I don't rabbit care. hole. I don't care. Yeah, we're rabbit holing. I don't care. That's what we do. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, it, it's not, you know, you call it the Army of the Potomac at Antietam. Is it really? It's the you know it's a lot of Army of Virginia guys just, yeah. just been put in there. It's the Army of Potomac Virginia Garrison with okay. a whole bunch of nine month guys mm-hmm. that haven't fired a shot, right? Right. You know, you look at the 16th Connecticut in the auto cornfield. They had just joined the military three in weeks. Three weeks, right? Yeah, they're not even a month. <clears> so in he's yet. got he's got. Well, Colin has got officers like um, Mansfield rides out from D.C. and gets shot. Brand new to command. Mm-hmm. The 128th PA, Crowsnails Knoll, they come over there and take take it on the chin. They're a brand new regiment. That's a nine-month regiment. He's got nine-month regiments all over the place that have just been in there since 60, since August. You've got Virginia, Army of Virginia guys that got, you know, shellacked, it, shellacked at Second Manassas. <laughs> yeah. He's he's trying to form all this stuff together. And as my friend Tom Clemens famously tells me very frequently. Until the day of the battle, Lee has more cavalry than McClellan does because he's mm-hmm. still getting them off the ships from the peninsula to get them back. And what does cavalry do? It's your intelligence, ga- intelligence gathering arm. Mm-hmm. He's hampered by the fact he doesn't have enough scouts to tell him exactly where Lee is. So. Right. right. Yeah, anyway, the, yeah. In, the intelligence war is another aspect of the Maryland campaign that I've done quite a bit with as well. And and Tom's a a good friend and acquaintance, and he and I have discussed this quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not saying George McClellan is the greatest general in the history of the Army of the Potomac. Sure, but he we do get have the credit. We we he's under a little underappreciated. People toss off that. Well, he was a great organizer, and he organized the Army of the Potomac. They toss that off, right? Do you know how hard it is to organize stuff at that time period? That many guys. Mm. That's no easy feat his ego i i do believe wouldn't let mcclellan just stay in an administrative capacity he wanted to command a field army but you can't undervalue he builds an army that is going to be able to take the the beating of antietam starting with antietam 
uh, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, the Overland campaign. And then it really changes complexion when the draftees start coming in right. in 64, as you guys know, in the Petersburg area. He builds an army that can that that just, you know, takes body blows for how many battles, right? Even the ones they win. Even the ones they win. He <laughs> yeah. helps. Yeah, exactly. He helps build this army that will sustain the Union through at least two plus years of incredible fighting right. before it really begins to change complexion and the war is very different at that point so he deserves more credit for that he's getting more credit now than he has in a long time mm -hmm. right well because uh, all right so one one and of Steve the and tom are big reasons for that too. oh yeah both of no i think that those guys sort of began the charge mm -hmm. if you will and then the rangers at antietam have really picked it up they've too. picked it up and then, like, James McPherson says, hey, yo, McClellan, you know. So that's cool. That's the way it's supposed to work, right? You know, someone's got to talk about it and get it started. Well, you got to give credit where it's due. And that's sort of the thing that always annoyed me is, is like, as much as, like, I'm a Yankees fan, right? And I yeah. love New York Yankees. But, like, you know. The Pirates they, beat my Pirates fan. They, they, they beat them last night. Yes, I saw that. They might <laughs> I just want to say that. Today. I saw that. But the Yankees, right, like, back when the, the Yankees-Red Sox rivalry was still a real rivalry, right. even though it's it's dead now right but, like we had to tip our cap to david ortiz you know yeah. like that was a guy that like i didn't like the guy but i respected him right credit due that guy right. could mash yankee fastball right. so right. <laughs> you gotta give it to mcclellan yeah um because here are the facts right you know he gets three armies put three commands put together he's got his aop he's got the v army of virginia and then he's got the washington garrison right they all come together yeah. and they get moving in like three days yeah he builds that whole army you just spoke about while it's mobile right. he doesn't mobile. build it at right. home in washington yeah um and then it, it it's longevity is incredible too the other thing i i like to say about mcclellan is and a lot of this is warranted because he is a very hard, uh, gruff guy I guess you right. could say politically and, and uh, personally, socially, I guess. But he um, a lot of the things we cite about his personality and the rudeness he has for, you know, the presidency and things like that. Like we judge from letters he wrote to his wife. Right. And I can't stress this enough. I say this all the time. The things I say to my wife are between me and my wife. Right. <laughs> like it's one of those like you don't. I would be damned if like somebody read every single thing that I said honestly to my wife. And a lot of what McClellan says to his wife is now publicly known to all of us and we yeah. judge him for that. And it's like right. yeah. think about what you say to your you know, your better halves and partners, people yeah, like right. you, you know, you yeah. be uh, kind of pissed. Well, and sometimes <laughs> let's face it, sometimes when you're talking oh, to your crap. your significant other, you sort of embellish how I really told this guy off and boy, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. and it's not really, I mean, I'm guilty of it. I'll admit it. Me too. On air. That <laughs> I kick I'm, everybody's ass that, that talks you, trash at the know, park. <laughs> I'm like, and I'm like, and you know what that I said, honey? And you know what? It's probably, maybe I wasn't quite as, you know, vocal at the time, but. <laughs> the uh, things I wanted to say. It, it, yeah. But, you know, I, I don't think that. I would have wanted to have a beer with McClellan, honestly. I think right. he's an elite aristocrat. He would have probably been sort of stiff, but. That's not the point here, right? Yeah. The, the point is he had some skills. He had some faults. That's, Certainly. you know, no, no doubt about it. But I don't, uh, I don't think he gets the credit that, you know, he really should for some of these, these things, with, you know, with the Army of the Potomac and pursuing Lee. Fair way to say this, potentially. He doesn't get the credit he, deser he deserves alongside of the criticism he receives. Right. Oh, that's exactly right. I like right. the way you phrased that. Like that's he should good. get out of yeah. both cups. Well, yeah. All right, let's get out of the rabbit hole. Let's get back on okay. track. We were just talking <laughs> about these guys right. as they were, um, I guess, just on the other side of the Fredericksburg campaign, because you did mention that they were engaged, I guess, at Chancellorsville. Well, so have yeah, we moved so into the summer let's of 63? Let's talk a little bit more about Fredericksburg. Yeah, Fredericksburg, yeah, yeah. Is, Fredericksburg. Is, Fredericksburg is sort of Tyler's brigade's they fight at Chancellorsville, but Fredericksburg is sort of their big, big fight. Okay. So they go in. Humphrey's division is the last federal division to make an attack on the, the notorious Mary's Heights. Yeah. Right. They go in right as it's dusk. Okay. Okay. And really, all box brigade takes the lead. Uh, Tyler's is more of a bit of a supporting role. But they will form up, and Tyler talks about how it's dusk. It's very muddy. It's, you know, the ground's been churned up by thousands of Second Corps troops that have already gone up against the wall. Mm -hmm. They are ordered. Humphreys is kind of. So I guess what's the word I want? A lot of people think Humphreys is kind of a jerk, right? Mm -hmm. OK, so he's not super enthusiastic. Let's it, put it that he's way. not super enthusiastic. <laughs> he's not well liked by these guys. And there's a book I brought here that a lot of people haven't heard about, which I want to talk about a little bit. 
And uh, so he, he, Humphreys writes he was as giddy as a schoolgirl when he found out his division was going to go in. Well, oh. yeah. Mm. That's kind of an odd way to think about you're going to send your fresh troops into a meat grinder. Yeah. But yeah. he forms them up at dusk and they, they, they are ordered to not stop and fire, just to rush the wall. Okay. He makes all the field officers, including Tyler, go in mounted. What? Because these guys are green. The colonel of the 134th, Edward O'Brien, will have a bullet go from the pommel to the cantle of his saddle underneath him. Whoo! Didn't hit him. Didn't hit his horse. It went, just, through, it went through his saddle right under his crotch. Like, just as he happened to bounce in the saddle? Or? Well, it went through the actual the structure of the saddle. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Everybody is lucky there. I'm just stuck on the fact that there are people mounted charging the wall. Yeah, he too. made, he made, so the colonels, like, the colonels have to go in mounted, and the, certainly the brigadier generals are mounted. Oh, my God. So they rushed the wall, and as they're going across uh, the, the fields in front of Mary's Heights, they come upon this swale that a lot of guys talk about. Mm-hmm. And down in this swale are all these demoralized Second Corps guys that can't move because if you get out of the swale, you're going to get killed. Right. And so as, Humph- as, as Humphrey's guys go across this swale, these Second Corps guys rise up out of the ground tackling these, these nine-month guys. Don't go on. You're going to get slaughtered. And Tyler talks about it. Almost every colonel talks about how it disorganized their ranks, slowed the momentum of their attack, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? They do rush the wall, and like every other Union regiment, they're pushed back. Mm-hmm. Now, if you, d- depending on who you read, these nine-month guys left their dead closer to the wall than any other Union regiment. Partially because, I think, they're new and don't know what they're getting into. They're not veterans, and it's the sort of like hyper-enthusiasm of ignorance. Yeah, right. and exactly. they're just like we're gonna do it, and they go and they're like crap. We're doing it, and they they get really, you know, heavily shot up. You were gonna say something, uh, Dan. I'm I'm just yes. glad you brought that up because it's something that I, I tease Pat about because <laughs> I've got Pat McGuire, he's about the most Irish you can be and oh, be and I've got, still be yeah, full blooded. I've got American. family in the brigade, and so wow. we left our dead closest to the wall. Don't you know that? <laughs> Everybody but it is definitely that. Humphrey's division that gets close. <laughs> yeah, no, so I everybody mean, says they're the closest. That's how well, and there's like post-war controversies Absolutely. about this, and yeah. like the, the like you know the Tyler's guys are in these controversies. They're like, no way, you know, we were the closest guys up there. Now there's a famous uh, Alfred Wode, one of his pencil mm-hmm. drawings, and of all of the attacks, it's Humphrey's division that's in this is pictured in this, which I can't get over that you know my relatives are potentially right you know yeah yeah and it shows humphreys out in front waving his hat mm. as these guys um uh his division begins their attack at dusk and it shows humphreys division's attack so for uh uh and the uh, uh woad and other officers including confederates said of all the attacks that day Humphrey's division was the most impressive. And I think what's going on there is because these guys are not worn down by previous battle. Right. They're fairly large right. still. Exactly. And they are green, so they're not wavering. Mm-hmm. And it's it's also the time of day because it was like the golden hour, right? Mm-hmm. So the sun is on these guys and they see this what they call this blue wall just come out of Fredericksburg and uh, I can't remember the Confederate said we all stopped and just watched it hmm. until we started to shoot it and tear it apart. Until we destroyed it. Yeah. And so it's these nine month guys that do this. So they acquit themselves very, very well. And Tyler acquits himself well, you know, and he writes the report. And then Tyler does something that just infuriates Humphreys. <laughs> he writes his report and he submits it directly to Andrew Curtin the governor of Pennsylvania, Ooh. he does not run it through Humphreys first. Right. Ooh. And that sets Humphreys off. Yeah. Don't, uh, don't go around the chain. Don't go around your he, boss, he, bro. He, he, it's, it sets Humphreys off. So Humphreys <laughs> is going court, to court-martial <laughs> Tyler. Tyler's brought up on a court-martial about this. Hmm. And Humphreys also achu- accuses him of cowardice and all sorts of stuff. Wow. Yeah. That's bold. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's a big, big deal 
And eventually Tyler is acquitted with except one charge, which is failing to, I forget the technical term, follow correct procedure in filing his report. But he earns the enmity of Humphreys, okay, mm. at this point. And they are not, not... Why does he do this? Like, why does he just... Well, I don't know, to be honest. Now, this brings in this book. And this book is really interesting, I think. This book is called Red Tape and Pigeonhole Generals. <laughs> That's a great title. Okay. Andrew A. Humphreys in the Army of the Potomac. Most people haven't heard of this book. Red Tape and Pigeonhole Generals is an old book written by a veteran. And I'm going to cheat sheet here so I get his name right. It's written by Lieutenant Colonel William Armstrong of the 129th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry, one of Tyler's regiments, okay? Basically, this guy writes a fictionalized history of his service, changes the names because they hate Humphreys. <laughs> oh, wow. And the guy that he assigns the Humphreys role comes off as just a jackass, martinet, disliked, and the, the guy that assumes a Tyler role is their defender who's mm -hmm. trying to keep this Martinet at bay and not abuse these guys. All different sorts of, like, harsh disciplines he's trying to, like, Tyler's trying to defuse. Humphreys, like, is fining guys because they're not wearing their dress coats, their frock coats. He wants them to wear those because they look more soldierly. And they're not as comfortable. And Tyler's like, you don't have to wear your dress coats. Wear your four-button sack blouses. It's fine. They hate Humphreys. And he actually writes this book about this, and part of it is because it is court martial, you know, hmm. because he's trying to defend. And it was released, you know, um, during the war. Oh. oh, see, I didn't know that. Yeah, I'd, heard of, I'd <laughs> heard of the work, but I wasn't aware that it was released I, during the war. Guys in Humphreys units are like, why does this sound so familiar I, to me? <laughs> I hope I am not wrong, but that's my recollection. That was published in 1864. Wow. Humphreys, Humphreys reads this book. It's like, I don't know why you hate this guy so much. Honest, this, guy's, this guy's awesome. Yeah, and honestly written and published in 64. Wow. wow. And That's... so it's like an indictment of Humphreys. Hmm. And it's, it's, it goes back to this, you know, dislike these two guys have for each other. So, you know, Tyler's an interesting guy, right? You know, he's got some interesting, he's seen some heavy battle. He's got this interesting feud. They go on the fight at Chancellorsville. They're not heavily engaged, but they are engaged. They help hold open a road to one of the fords that's going to allow Hooker's, then Hooker's, Joe Hooker's army mm -hmm. to get back across the Rappahannock. And um, they're going to take some casualties. And if you go to Chancellorsville now, they have new waysides, the NPS does. Oh, nice. Talking about Tyler's brigade in particular. Uh, and their fight uh, along, gosh, I think they're defending U.S. Ford. Okay. Okay. You know, and holding open this line of retreat as the Confederates are trying to break through and cut it off. And it was, a, you know, a vital little action there. But May 63 rolls around. Oh, at that battle, Tyler gets in a fight with a, at the adjutant of the 91st Pennsylvania. Like a fight? Like a fist fight? Well, he accuses him of cowardice. See... Every time I hear this, I know it's a big deal, but like you, you catch some hands if you start calling me a coward, like yeah. a real life. He said like he assigned, he asked the adjutant of the 91st to go to the rear and deliver an order, and he couldn't find him, and he found him hiding behind a tree. Ah. Oh, that's, I mean, that sounds like cowardice. And so um, that causes a big furor, right? Yeah. And it gets Tyler back, named back up in a controversy. Sure. May 63, all the nine month guys enlistments run out. Mm hmm. The 91st is transferred to another brigade, and Tyler's left without a command. And he's sent to the city defenses of Baltimore or the middle department, where careers go to die. die. <laughs> yes. Who goes? Lou Wallace goes there. Yes, That's he right. does. What did Lou Wallace do? Lou Whoa. Wallace. Well, what, he it's what he didn't do. <laughs> he, ran, he got, you know, whether he deserves it or not. I think the right. term is scapegoat. Right. Scapegoat, yes. yeah. That's the term exactly. that comes so to So he's over there. Um, what was Shank's first name? Julius? Something like I that? I think so. I was looking at this earlier today, actually. But... And Shank is the commander of the middle department, you know, another guy that's sort of a marginal. Right. And they get, they get shifted over to Baltimore, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, Tyler is going to spend most of the rest of the, um, the war from May 63 on in this capacity in Baltimore. You know, so it's like he's not the department commander. He's in charge of the city defenses of Baltimore. Right. So Robert, it's Robert Schenck. Robert Schenck. I don't know why I thought Julius, but Schenck. Robert. 
Thank you for looking that up. I just sometimes I'm just like, that's ah, going to annoy me. I need to know. No, I'm glad you one. did. Real time correction. Yeah, it, was, it would have annoyed one. me too. I just had to know it. So, and I, I know, Matt, you know about Tyler's role at his last engagement, mm-hmm. which is here in, can we say the name? I we mean, can uh, talk about the place <laughs> the, <laughs> where the Battle of Monocacy okay. Junction okay. took place. Yeah. Whether certain people affiliated with this podcast or no are professionally <laughs> are associated with, with the place, we don't it. know. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. We just know that Matt okay. is a park ranger in the federal system. It's a system. But and we he can't... just happens to know a crap ton about this particular, particular story. engagement. <laughs> oh, that's what, okay. He's so, there a lot. He's there a lot. He's there a lot. Five okay. days a week, nine yeah. to five. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to say without wanting comment, I sure as heck hope he does work there because if he's there a lot and he's supposed to be somewhere else yeah yeah good yeah. point <laughs> then what are my tax dollars exactly. doing that's what i gotta I'm say on I, detail. Ask, I ask this question anyway but you yeah. know <laughs> yeah yeah so um so he does tyler will hold open the retreat route he does yep at the battle monocacy a significant role and even um Lou Wallace says, I gave him all the green guys. You know, mm-hmm. it's a uh, fresh rookie guys, meaning, you know what I mean? Because yeah. he's got those Ohio 100 Days National Guard dudes. Yeah, and that's a great point. Um, it, they are actually National Guard. That's, that's is their names of these units, the 144th, 149th, and the 156th, which is actually a mounted infantry regiment. Okay. Uh, so he's got three regiments of these Ohio National Guard boys. They put up a heck of a fight up near Jug Bridge, which is about two miles north of the main battlefield around Monoxy Junction, holding that line of defense, or excuse me, the, the line of defense, but the retreat route all day. Um, and what's interesting about that fight is, is that their line doesn't give way until after the rest of Wallace's force is pulled out. Uh, wow. Wallace's line collapses at about five o'clock. They flee to the northeast, link up with what is today Route 144, the Baltimore Pike. Yeah. And then begin to head off towards Baltimore. And it's around 5:30, 6 o'clock that the Ohio Guard regiments are getting outflanked um, around Jug Bridge. And Erastus Tyler will actually tell his command to flee. Mm-hmm. He, yeah. he, he, held, he held on so long with those regiments that they are literally being fired into their backs at this point. And he just tells them to go. Flee yeah, there's no the organized, just get out of here just now. Just get out. Yeah. Just get out. Yeah. And in fact, Erastus Tyler, and, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, he and his adjutant, I believe, are wandering around the countryside for about three days until they link back up with That's Wallace. fascinating. I wasn't quite aware of that. And that's really cool. So they and just break off contact and like just disappear into the, the his whole area? command disintegrates. Disintegrates, yeah. And they and they're moving back east to the best of their ability ability along the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. And Arasis Tyler, he's mounted um, and so is his adjutant, but they basically just go into mm-hmm. the, the wilderness, as it were, Yeah, with the rest of this command. And, of course, the Confederates can't really pursue because they're going to have to pull back and head south. Right. So it just saves them. But those Rhodes guys out there, right? Right. That's Robert. At the Jug Bridge. Yeah, yeah. that's yes. Rhodes. Yeah. I mean, we're as, not talking. As dear Ed would say, Robert Rhodes. Robert right. Rhodes. Right. The Norse god. Right. He doesn't look like a Norse god. But anyway, <laughs> that was, uh, no, uh, who wrote the books? Oh, gosh. The, the. Everybody, the three, the volume South, Douglas South, oh, Freedom, Doug, yes, of course, called uh, Roads of the Norse God, looked like hmm. a Norse God, and uh, yeah, so we're not talking chump Confederates, no, there, not at all, you know. And they managed to hold open this retreat route, and the jug of the jug bridge is still there, yes, it's, it's not at the bridge it's anymore, moved. it's right. been moved, yep. And so, you, the, is the, the site where Tyler fought that's pretty well destroyed right unfortunately yes a big chunk of it actually just this past last summer um there was an archaeological survey done on a part of that site because there's an ohio national guard depot there and they wanted to put in a new um water line okay or some or something along those lines and yeah. they had to do an archaeological survey because there was a battle there uh they didn't find anything that's that whole area has been pretty cut up between the agriculture that's there and now all the development because there the there's two bridges that have gone in since the jug bridge okay collapsed. Say, this is the area we unofficially didn't visit right correct <laughs> right now, a lot of this is on private property so, the, so matt and i did not go there sort of tyler's far right is to the north 
Yes. Yeah. Is that where 70 crosses? Roughly. Uh, Hughes Ford is his far right, okay. uh, which is a little bit north of Jug Bridge. Okay. Um, okay. And actually, there's probably a inch. Sorry for the rabbit hole, Pat. Why are you apologizing for <laughs> your own damn show? Uh, there's... It's your show you can do. Yeah, Matt's That's like, true. I'm sorry, listeners. I broke my own rules. Yeah. But you love rabbit holes. Just do it. There is a, what I believe was a sighting of uh, Bradley Johnson's cavalry leaving the area. Cool. Oh wow! When he begins the Johnson Gilmore. No raid. kidding. Yeah, and and because there is talk of Confederate cavalry being up near Hughes Ford at the beginning of the battle, so this is like six a.m. ish. Yeah. Um, they run into some of these Ohio National Guard guys, and then they disappear again. Well, they go further north, is what happens, and go around to go east. Wow. Uh, and I think it's and I think it's Bradley Johnson leaving the area. The raid to hopefully liberate everyone at point lookout yeah that ridiculous thing that was never going to work and and you bring them back in the confederate army you picked the worst place to start that you're in like the easternmost part of western maryland right, and you got to right. go all the way down to the tippy tip oh, of st mary man. Like, we'll do, we'll do a show on no the johnson we, we gilmore have to. raid but it's to, as much as i don't care for bradley johnson it's not really his fault no He's but just that episode's called logistical him. stupidity um <laughs> it it really shows you the desperation, correct? No, of course. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, early's trying to get cash from towns, and yep. you know, and you know, and then this raid is desperation. The idea to capture DC is they almost did it, but it's you know, it's a hail mary. Yeah, I always retreat. I always retreat to boxing analogies, and you know, a dangerous fighter. Uh, the most dangerous yep. fighter is a desperate fighter, yep. and mm-hmm. the Confederacy is starting to become desperate. Right. And that one right. haymaker you throw can change a fight, and that's what they're trying to do. Yep. Yeah. And they came hell of freaking close to doing it. Yep. Thank yeah, God. it's it's um it's I'm glad Monocacy's preserved a rabbit hole. I know I think you have on display the original plan for the battlefield. Yes. Which was everything. Yeah. Well, was, most everything. Wasn't it back in the twenties? <clears throat> uh it it's what's interesting about that is that the original plan map for the battlefield is actually written uh, drawn up by Glenn Worthington. Oh, right. Uh, Kiddo himself. Yeah. The kid that was on, you know, exactly. w- watched through the He writes window. the first campaign study. Uh, Fighting for Time, it, while it's not the best cited work ever, mm-hmm. it's the first campaign yeah. study of the Monoxy campaign. And, and he produces this book in 28, and then he's really pushing the idea of making this a National Park Service site. So 1933, the National Military Parks, the big five, the originals, are turned over from the War Department to the the Department of Interior, specifically the National Park Service. And so 1934 rolls around, and there's this kind of momentum in Congress Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. preserve more battlefield sites and give them to National Park Service to administer. And so that's how Monocacy is developed. Now, there's no funds attached to that uh, yeah. legislation, so it's a park in name only right. for about 40 years. Um, but the original drawing up of the plans was done in large part through Glenn Worthington. Okay. And that map um, really focuses heavily on mm-hmm. the Worthington farm. It's like smack dab in the middle of what yeah. he's proposing for the battlefield, and it doesn't quite get all the way up to Jug Bridge. Okay. Yeah. It, it's cool. It's cool and sad to see um, what was it proposed before two seventy. Right, cuts the park exactly in half. Not a half, but goes right through where Pretty some close. heavy fighting took place. I mean, it yeah. kind of splits it in half. Almost. Yeah, you know and what the you, saddest part about two seventy is? If it had taken ten more years to build, it probably wouldn't have gone there because it goes in in about nineteen fifty five and nineteen sixty four. The Historic Preservation Act passes. Oh boy. So if it had been a little bit longer in coming, it probably would have gone around it. And if you, anyone <laughs> listening hasn't been to, to Monocacy, 270 is a huge yeah. four-lane highway that runs between Frederick, Maryland, and Washington, D.C. It's a huge commuter alley, massive road. They keep wanting to widen it, yep. which is terrifying uh, because it, it's the Worthington House is... The lane back there is right next to the... Uh, and that's a non-period lane, too. That uh, was put in just so the Park Service could still get access to the Worthington okay. Farm. Yeah, the, and it, what's the other big house there you guys just got? Worthington Thomas. Thomas. Uh, that's the administrative headquarters. Yeah. yeah. And the Thomas Farm, a little advertisement for the 
unnamed battlefield, Monocacy. <laughs> Un- unnamed battlefield. Grant was there. He was. With, yep. with Sheridan, I believe. He was. Conferring there. That's August big, of 64. Big deal stuff, you yep. know. Hancock's there in 63. Yeah, planning some high strategy in that on, on what is the Monocacy battlefield. I yeah. love Grant's visit there because <laughs> I always like to imagine it goes down like Vince McMahon. Because, like, you know, a lot of people, when they think you're fired, they think of one person in particular. When I hear you're fired, I think vintage late 90s, early 2000s, Vince McMahon. Oh. They just scream. Teams. Yeah! Fire! And David Hunter just wilts and then gets stone cold yeah. stunned by the yeah. Grant yeah. right there in the yeah. Thomas Farmhouse. That's, yeah. how, that's how it happened historically for those of you out there. Look it up. It's a real well, I, I always encourage people, you know, you come out here and you got Antietam and you got Gettysburg, do it, but don't overlook Monocacy. Don't sleep on Monocacy. Yeah, because yeah. Some, and we appreciate that. There's some cool stuff there and some cool monuments. And unfortunately, this right flank area where Tyler was is just sort of. You know, it wasn't connected, so it kind of got correct. I have a question. Okay. Is that's Monocacy Junction, right? Correct. Basically. It's like Mm -hmm. its own little village. Yeah. Practically. So I've I've been this is a, can I go on a rabbit yeah, trail? Yeah, man, please. And we'll get back to Tyler. You're our guest. You can do whatever <laughs> we'll you back, want, we'll Dana. We'll get back to Tyler. So I've always been interested in in another one of these like overlooked things. Are you you familiar with William Rank's section of guns that was at Monocacy uh junction before the Gettysburg campaign? Before the Gettysburg campaign. Only only a little bit because Camp Hooker's out that way. Okay. So William Rank was Watch your mouth, Matt. Was in yeah. Was in the third Pennsylvania Heavy Artillery. Okay. And the third PA Heavy Artillery was administered out of Baltimore. Mm. At least portions of it were. And even though he's in a heavy artillery unit, Rank is given two three inch ordnance rifles, okay. a section, and they're sent to guard Monocacy Junction in that, that vicinity that I think is part of Park property, isn't mm-hmm. it? Yeah. So they're located there when Jeb Stewart's raid percolates and they're, you know, before Gettysburg. And they're like, we got to get out of here. And so Rank hitches up his guns, and they come out here in Carroll County somewhere and hide out. Hmm. It's it was at my house. It's here. It's right here <laughs> at the War Department. It could studio. be. There's a door here. Maybe that's where they were on the other side of the the, the, the well, studio. No, it would be interesting if they went to Union Bridge. My though. wife would hate that just because my <laughs> wife loves history, and then she married me. Now she can't stand it because she's like, that's the only thing you talk about. Yeah. We we buy this house, Dana. We get our keys, yeah. and we're here for the first time. And we're literally standing in our house in the first 20 seconds we're there. Yeah. We're the homeowners. Oh, this great moment. We're looking out the back window. She goes, what are you thinking about? And I was like, thousands of Union troops walking through our backyard. Through, yeah. <laughs> she goes, yeah. Oh! <laughs> well, then they they came up through Johnsville Union Bridge, all that stuff. Yeah, I mean they yeah. literally John Reynolds, right? His mm-hmm. posthumously visits Union Bridge because this is the first place he gets uh, put into a coffin and that taken is down here. His mm-hmm. size, because when he gets put into a box yeah. in Gettysburg, he's yeah. he's put in kind of for cocktail because he's yeah. a little taller right. than the box. Right, 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 right. Well, I mean, here at 15 West Broadway was where the uh, the Undertaker and, and all that was, and they put him in a correct size box, put him right on the Western Maryland Railway. Yeah. And Her- there Herman Haupt show at that time and just yep. sent him on yeah. to Lancaster. Right, right. Um, but yeah, no, on the way in, the s- I don't know. It has it to the be second the sixth, cor- sixth. I feel, Is it the sixth, sixth Sedgwick? I would think sixth is out here. I thought part of the second core swings near Could here, be. too, because I know that a little bit further west of us is fifth core. They go up through Tawny Town. Right. But I'm pretty sure it's elements of sixth and second that go up through here. Yeah, okay. But either way, thousands swath. of troops yeah, go right through this town. Massive, yeah. Yeah, incredible. We're not here to talk about how cool my town is, though, guys. <laughs> well, I mean, come on. What was I? Uh, we were talking about William Ranks. Right. right. Okay, so back to back to the William uh, Rank thing. Yes, I don't have to do the uh, effect. Thank uh, you, Dana. They're not, in fact, they're not, in fact, in this house as, at this yeah, current moment. Right. So, <laughs> or are so they? They, they, you know, they, they flee because they don't want to get captured. And as they're coming out of hiding here in Carroll County, wherever they went, I, I've looked and I do not know exactly where they went. They run into David Gregg's, David McMurtry Gregg's cavalry division. Hmm. Okay. He's pursuing Stewart. And he runs in and he says, literally, and he's like, where are you going? And Rank says, we're going back to Baltimore. And he says, no, you're not. You're coming with us. So by happenstance, three-inch ordnance rifles or the preferred cavalry artillery piece because they're light. Right. Mm. And they don't like Napoleons. They're too heavy. And so yeah. they must have mounted these guys up and made them horse artillery but they end up going with Greg's division. And if you look at the order of battle for the Battle of Gettysburg, you'll see, I forget the brigade commander, but they're attached. 3rd Pennsylvania Heavy Artillery, 
They're not part of the Army of the Potomac. They're out of the middle department. That's wild. So they are put, those two guns are on the uh, Hanover Road near Brinkerhoff's Ridge. They're in the rear of Allegheny Johnson's division. Okay? Mm -hmm. There's heavy skirmishing out there on the evening, uh, late afternoon, early evening of July 2. And because of that, um, there's a famous account of there's this knot of Confederate officers forms on Brinkerhoff's Ridge, and they're observing these federal cavalrymen, this heavy skirmishing. And uh, Greg rides down to one of Rank's cannoneers and says, fire a feeler up toward these officers, <laughs> okay? Call it beginner's luck, who knows what. They fire the, the cannon, and the shell burst right over these officers, and they take off in all different directions. And largely, and it's actually documented, right? So Johnson will hold back Walker's Stonewall Brigade because of the vigorous cavalry skirmishers reinforced by artillery. Hmm along the Hanover Road. And Walker's Stonewall Brigade does not participate in the attacks on the night of July 2nd on Culp's Hill because of that. That's 12, 1,300 guys. Yeah. Now, you know, on Culp's Hill that night, it was only George Green's brigade yep. of 1,300 guys that's attacked by three Confederate brigades. Now, they hold them off just barely. They just barely hold off these three Confederate brigades. Had the Stonewall Brigade been in that attack, they would have had a much better chance of lapping Green's right flank and getting to the Baltimore Pike. And I can't say that would have changed the, they would have won the battle, but it would have caused tremendous havoc for the Army of the Potomac. Absolutely. That's what we say about Fredericksburg a lot when we talk about Meade breaking through the line where, you know, one of the things I'm critical of is a guy that people in July are not critical of, which is, you know, John Fulton Reynolds. We love to celebrate his arrival on the field right. on the first day. But I say, you know, you go back a few months in, in December of 62, and you can make a case that he screws the pooch. Because if he is where he should be, when Meade is looking for reinforcements and not getting into a screaming match with Bernie and things like that. Right. That you know that battle perhaps goes a little bit differently. Right. So like, that's why we both love and hate what ifs here on this yeah. show because like there's they can be fun, right. but they can be so dangerous at the same time. Oh yeah, uh, but I just find it fascinating that these two little cannons that were at Frederick, Maryland, on property now part of the Mount Ocasey battlefield, yeah. end up with the Army of the Potomac. They're not supposed to be there, and they fire a few shots that really have, an, a, have a huge effect. impact on the battle. That's awesome, though. They have a huge impact on the battle, and then the next day. They send them over to these two guns of ranks, and you'll, you'll. There's a monument to that on the Hanover Road that you'll see. It's hard to see because it's right on the road, but it's to the Third PA Heavy Artillery Rank Section. They have a monument out there, and then they have a tablet on Cemetery Ridge, with and with two guns down from the PA monument because they move them over there, and they will shoot at Pickett's Charge on July three. Sweet. And then the battle's over, and they're sent back to Baltimore, and they never see action again. But those guys are all veterans of Gettysburg, man. I like how you could just get swept up in a tidal awesome. wave of momentum. Isn't that awesome? They're veterans of Gettysburg, and they weren't even in the Army of the Potomac. Yeah. I love that. This right? is... Yeah, it's crazy. And it's like it's like the secret battle location <laughs> is where these guys were originally. I'm going to definitely have to check that out. I, uh, yet another excuse to go visit Gettysburg and again. That's like yeah. we needed another one. So there's a mon <laughs> Yeah, and it, it, out on the Hanover Road, you'll see their monument, and then they have a tablet there on Cemetery Ridge. This hmm. is exactly like Bill Paxson and Twister. <laughs> you know, like he shows up just to get some deport, divorce paper signed, and then suddenly he's swept uh, right into the whole tor storm chasing uh, team again, and he's he's actually the one whose truck gets destroyed at the end. These oh. guys, these guys are just you know they get swept right up. Yeah. They're just there looking for some you know Jeb Stewart cavalry. Is suddenly, yeah. Well, they're not even they're trying to get away. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're trying like, to get away. Right. They're like run away, run away. <laughs> but suddenly you know? they're just swept right yeah, up, and right, now they're storm right. chasers, and their trucks getting destroyed. Except yeah, yeah. it's a cannon. Yeah, I don't right. know how you could make those two wild. <laughs> Probably <laughs> different things actually work, McGuire, but you know yeah, well done. Works. You've been doing this show with me long enough. It <laughs> takes me, uh, I have to find my moment with you every episode to just blow your head apart. Well, there, there it was. was. The brain yeah. exploded. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Well, uh, um... So where are we go with oh, uh, Tyler? Tyler, <laughs> Tyler. Oh yeah, why are we here? Tyler. Dana, why were you here again? <laughs> Tyler. It's Tyler, it's Tyler. So, okay, so the war ends, right? <laughs> right. Tyler will get part of that big omnibus product uh, promotion and mm -hmm. he doesn't, you know, he's stuck at Brigadier General. Oh, well, one last thing. Humphreys, who hates Tyler, will become the Army of the Potomac's chief of staff. Mhm. Mm so forget it, Tyler, you're not going to get back in the Army of the Potomac, right? That 
the enmity he built ship up. Has sailed. That's yeah. why he stays in Baltimore, you know, partially because he he's made an enemy of Humphreys and Humphreys has too much power. But he still gets promoted to bri- a major general uh, when the war ends. A whole bunch of brigadiers get promoted, including Tyler. So 1877, kind of fast forward, Rutherford B. Hayes is president. And he is going to make Tyler the postmaster of Baltimore because Tyler stays in Baltimore. His social life kind of takes off. Like he, he, meet, he met someone when he was there. Isn't that what happened? Yeah. He, was it his wife? I think his first wife died. Mm. He met someone there. Yeah. But his social life, we're going to talk about here. A little. Okay. Yes, because <laughs> I love those stories. So <laughs> he, he, takes, he gets this patronage postmaster position. Okay. And at the same time, at, for a while at least, Harry Gilmore, the Confederate mm-hmm. Raider, is the chief of police in Baltimore. Yeah, that's pretty wild. So, who gave that guy that job? It's Baltimore. It's Baltimore. You know, we say that even <laughs> the 21st century. It's, it's Baltimore. Baltimore. <laughs> so, Tyler, and what what I found when I was trying to look, uh, you know, I and I'm, I'm really excited to be here because I haven't looked at my Tyler stuff in years, even though I've kind of bought, I've got a CDV of them, an image and stuff, and I've always kind of been aware of them. Uh, it, I went back in the day, I tried to follow his story post-war, and I stumbled upon this court case that takes place in the 1880s, let me, yeah, 1881, in the, in its, in the Baltimore American newspaper. Basically, a woman, a postal clerk named Mary A. Murray accuses Tyler of what we would refer to as sexual harassment. Oh, wow. And it's like big time. I brought my notes here, my old note cards. Look at this. I love it. Should we turn the lights down? Should we should we turn them like is this history after dark right this now? This is history. <laughs> this is like this is graduate school. Oh but yes. If Miss Mary said in spring of eighteen seventy seven, she was hired uh to work in a postal service and that she she what I remember is she was poor and older. You know, hmm. usually you would expect a woman to be Married by her age. I think she was in her early 30s. Ah, yes. Truly a spinster. (laughs) And so (laughs) she said that uh, during the first railroad riots in Baltimore, this is when this began, Tyler asked her to get a letter from a safe, and he followed her, and as she was bending over to get the letter out of the safe. Oh, no. He caught her hand and pressed it upon his person. Oh, wow. no. That's oh. that's serious. We went full Harvey Weinstein. Uh, yeah. From that time on, the harassment commenced, she said. Now, this is pretty remarkable. Wait, that and, was just the start? Yeah. It Holy. deserves more research because this happened between 1877 and 79 when she was sort of forced out of the Postal Service, hmm. okay? She didn't bring it to court until much later. And I can't imagine, you know, this is not typical of the time for women to bring these issues forward. Yeah, this has got to be, this has to be, like, substantive. Yeah, there's some meat right. to it. And, and supposedly he had done this to other women, she says in this, in this, in this trial. What I'm wondering is, why did she bring it up at this point? Who encouraged her? Because this is a big thing for a woman to do at the time, mm-hmm. right? Big, scary thing. I mean, it's huge now. It's a big, yeah. scary thing now. In a right. society that it shouldn't be, and it's still huge now. It's right. a big, scary thing now. And e- and then it's even... Yeah, it's, it's unspeakable. And yeah. She, yeah, exactly. And so she said she worked for the Postal Service between June of 1877 and December of 1879. And that numerous times he would place her hand below her waist. Oh, that is scandalous. She would burst into tears. At one time, he grabbed her so tight, he left bruises on her arms. Mm. Not cool, dude. No. She told her friends. They told him to avoid him, not to lose her job. But she couldn't uh, do that. And that he, um, and then she was fired. And she finally got up the courage to ask if he was going. Oh, no. He said, he, she said, are you going to fire me? And he said she would have no worry of being fired if, quote, she would have done as he wanted, unquote. Wow. That is cut and dry sexual harassment. He, yeah. he always was after her to go for carriage rides with him. Don't do it. Et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> et cetera. And she wanted $20,000 in damages. 
Um, Tyler will win on a technicality because she is not considered a resident of Baltimore. She's considered a resident of D.C. What? And again, I'm a little, I need to dig into this some more, but she doesn't win. Hmm. Okay. She doesn't win. Right. This story just okie doked me so hard. I know. I mean, can you? I mean, I liked Tyler all the way up. I know. Right, exactly. episode, right I know. up until right now. And this now. is the kind of thing, when you start poking around at some of these obscure guys, these stories are crazy. And, and like I said, when we uh, were off air, we know about all these Confederate brigadier generals. We seem to know all about the Confederate brigadier generals. Right. There's, for one thing, there's fewer of them, right? That's, sure. But, but, you know, we, like, we, who knows anything about Erastus Tyler? Nobody. Nope. Matt, you and I may be the foremost Erastus <laughs> Tyler experts in the world. Yeah. And, and only an for those few years of his arm. Yeah, for, you know, and it doesn't take much to do that, yeah, right? We just got an email from Erastus Tyler's family. They said, please tell us more, because they don't even know the guy. <laughs> yeah, right. They don't even know the guy. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, I, I believe he's buried in Baltimore's Greenmount Cemetery or Greenwood Cemetery. Yeah, Greenmount. Greenmount. Greenmount yeah. Somebody yeah. else is buried there, too. I know. Yeah, we don't like him. <laughs> yeah. Stupid John Wilkes Booth. Stupid John Wilkes <laughs> So Tyler, you know, kind of gets out of it. But in 1881, James Garfield becomes president. Oh, oh. <laughs> payback. He got the Jeez. votes that really mattered. <laughs> he becomes president. And one of his first duties is to recall Tyler to Washington and relieve him of his job. Hmm. He's like, why are you smiling so much, Mr. President? He's like, don't worry about it. You're fired. <laughs> You're fired. Yeah. Which you have to think. Garfield's like, it took me 20 years. But I still got But mine. I got you. Yeah. And they, you know, the scandal, they were aware of this too. You know, sure. I don't know how much that would have influenced Garfield at the time, but he sure enough got him in the Baltimore or DC as quick as he could after he became president and said, You're not postmaster anymore. Hmm. That's yeah. a big gig too. That's a serious oh, city yeah, to man. postmaster. That's a, like a, yeah, heck yeah, he was set up for life, you mm-hmm. know. And um, uh, so Tyler will stay. He will die ten years later in eighteen ninety one. Mm. Yeah, that's the end of him. Fairly but, young too. He's what in his late sixties. Yeah, he's not. Yeah, a lot of guys live lo- longer than that. Sixty eight. Yeah. Does okay. he does he live like quietly in his final years? Because remember, as, he's a social. As far as I can, in a way. Yeah, as far as I can. As far as I know, like I said, you got to do some more digging. But one of the things that's apparent in these Baltimore papers during this sexual harassment trial is that this Miss Murray is sort of set up as like, a, you know, this Southern woman being taken advantage of by this Yankee carpetbagger dude that got this job. You know, mm. you can really feel that in the writing in these papers. And it's just this interesting coda. And I mean, for someone you don't know much about, right, Tyler has this fictional narrative kind of written to defend him and then he ends his life with his horrible uh claim against him you know scandal scandal i I can't wait for you to look into this trial more i want to know more about it i know it's got me all like okay i gotta go back into this yeah and um i i now when i did this you weren't available to look at stuff digitally you know we're talking early night late right when i when i originally did this this folder is full of stuff uh like you know you could like Xerox copies Xerox off stuff. microfilm. Yeah. Yep. That's what I was doing. Now you have newspapers.com. Yeah. You know, all these other sources you can get in there and you can look and find all this other stuff. And also there's city records that are available now and trial records are available digitally you could look at to kind of explore some more stuff. Do you know, Dana, if um because there was such this back and forth in 61 in the papers when the 7th I know. was being formed. Yeah. Do we have anybody defending uh, Erastus Tyler in uh, during the scandal? Not that I found back oh, in the day. Oh, that's very interesting. Not that I found back in the day. Hmm. So, like, his his junior officers and men didn't come out of the woodwork to, like, <coughs> don't besmirch <clears throat> his good name? Not that I know of, you know. and um, No Lou Wallace? No. Hmm. Not, you know, that... And he's a lawyer. That's yeah. something. Lou hated the law. That though. is something that um, definitely worth looking at. Like I said, I haven't looked at this stuff in twenty years. <laughs> you know, um, and they may have. For all I know, I've not found anything published or anything. You know, um, I have. A, I own an original CDV of Tyler. and it's got his signature on it. It is his signature, and um, I'm looking at one that. 
Matt owns now, and I think that's his signature on there too. I'm so glad to hear that. You know, um, <laughs> because uh, you know he must have given a lot. It's the same view too. Yeah. But on the back of mine, it says the best brigadier in the army. So I always wondered if is that a nine month veteran? You know that owned this. You know who knows? But sure. you know, obviously he had his fans, right? Mm-hmm. He had his people like this book. You know, they really supported him, and his wartime record is fine. You know. It's, as far as Brigadier Generals go, he didn't screw up. You know, he was no worse than anybody else. He's a pretty competent commander, I would think. But then he uh, ends his life in this, this terrible, ends his career in this terrible scandal. I think that Lee lends credence to the whole people have always been people thing that we kind of focus on historically. I think sometimes yeah. we, we keep that in the cheeky spirit because we focus on how weird and quirky we are as people. But sometimes we're just messed up. Yeah. We do bad mm-hmm. stuff as people, and right. you know, wars are perpetrated by people. Right, so, exactly. You know, and, you know, um, you of course, a- I wasn't around. I don't know Mary Murray, but her accusations are so specific Yeah, that you're like, there has to be some credence here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure we got some listeners out there who are those people that are like, oh, well, you know, we've only just leveled the accusations. We haven't, right. you know, like, you know, it would happen to innocent until proven guilty. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. okay, like, one, I, I feel that, but, like... Come on, let's consider the context that we're having this conversation right. in. It's impossible to do this now, basically, and women are bravely doing it left and right, thankfully now. But we're not talking about 2022. No, we're right. not. And <laughs> I, when I, when I was century. looking through my notes and refreshing, I'm like, I was shocked all over again by the fact that you know she stepped forward. And I'm like, man. And I've looked on. I looked on Find a Grave, right? And there's a whole bunch. Mary Murray's not a uncommon. Sure. Like mm-hmm. probably. Mm-hmm. Irish Catholic name, I think. Yeah. And there's several Mary Murrays, even Mary A. Murray, buried in Baltimore. Yeah. So hmm. I'll have to, like, you know. Just compile a list and start checking it down. Hmm. Yeah, and see if I can find her grave and then see if I can find anything, you know, on census records. It's so much harder to research women still, you know. Absolutely. Okay. You know, a lot of people, you know, when you, because of the Civil War, if you're doing genealogy, there's, that's a huge starting point for so many people, service records and everything. And it's just easier to search men down because of the laws. And it's uh, right. women are, you know, it's not impossible. And I do want to kind of look at it again, among the many other things. But no one can take this topic and put, do anything with it. All right. It's listening. <laughs> you're, you're staking your claim. Yeah. If you're on newspapers.com right now, forget it. Do you not know? worry. The History Things podcast will fight whoever you need them yeah. to. We got your We're going to fight. We got there's, a wrestling, there's a wrestling belt. That's right. We are the world champs. We on are this table. The world champions of uh, historical podcasting. So, Let it be known to all of our colleagues. We are the champs. Yeah. Wow. So these guys, okay. <laughs> these guys are fighters. These guys are fighters. They're not yeah. messing around. I will stone cold stunner the crap out of your history podcast. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> and I'm just scrapping. Me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Matt's the guy that just won't get pinned. So Matt's just scrappy. I am. Uh, I'm fascinated by this subject because obviously, you know, we we do focus an immense amount on the warriors themselves. So the guys on the battlefield, how they fight, how they conduct themselves. But it's. I am actually glad that we're ending the story of John Tyler on a very serious. Did I say John? You said John. You know why that popped into my head? Because I watched Tombstone the other day. That's Uh, okay. That it just you know. (laughs) That's right. It's the it's just my brain. Everybody who's listening knows my brain at this point. If you're just now tuning in, get ready. When you go back, it's crazy when you listen to me talk. Um, But. And I derailed myself there. What the f- was I talking about? Talking about uh, Erastus Tyler. Oh, I said I, th- I think it's good that we end this on a on a sober note uh, as far as, like, you know, talking about somebody as an individual because there's a lot of people we can prop up militarily right. that aren't necessarily stand-up people, and that right. should be the other part of the conversation because right. we might start to deify somebody that isn't worth deifying. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And, Absolutely. you know, I'm not saying that people deify Tyler here, but it's well, definitely— Well, it's, it's history is made up of flawed individuals. Yes, Absolutely. Right? Was George Washington flawed? Yes. Oh, Absolutely. yeah. He starts a whole world war, among other He's flaws flawed. he has. But I still respect the hell out of Washington. He's yeah. one of my favorite historical figures. Slavery is a huge stain on his, you know, but yeah. you know, looking at it, you know, like that's a, you know, a whole different thing. But, you know, he's mm-hmm. flawed. Lincoln is flawed. Every, mm-hmm. You know, Absolutely. I'm flawed. We are. Well, Matt says he's not flawed. But Matt is not flawed. Yeah. I've worked with him for years <laughs> yeah. now. He is yeah. perfect yeah. in every way. But, um, yeah, right. Model human being. Model human being. But, you know, and it's <laughs> like, you know, Tyler's <laughs> men respected him and they said he looked after us and took care of us and tried to, you know, keep this Martinette Humphreys at bay. And then he does this horrible thing, you know, and 
does that preclude us from saying he did a good job at Fredericksburg? I, I don't think so, you know, but you have to recognize the other spec- right. aspect of it as well. Absolutely. Take and the good and the bad. There is a full story, and the full stories are things that should be told. So, yeah, Dana, this was incredible. I uh, I really was wondering what this was going to be like. I was like, we're going to talk. We don't really focus on single individuals. Not I don't think often. we've ever. I mean, this is this the first time we've done it? Like, rack your brain. Season one, we didn't. Season two, we didn't. I mean, we covered Booth, but not directly Booth, because we covered the whole plot. Right. And that's probably the closest we had. So what do you gen- what's a general topic? Like, what do you generally, a typical podcast? So normally, we just pick a... Su- <laughs> Go back and listen to the show. Yeah, Dana, what yeah. are you doing? God. <laughs> oh, it's true. Uh, no, I mean, for Definitely. us, our average thing is just, we, I think we, to sum it up for people that have heard it for the millionth time, is we believe in the art of storytelling. Okay. Not just in the, like regurgitation of right, fact. Right, 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 right. We, right like, there's, right, like yeah. you made him a living person for mm-hmm. the hour and a half we've mm-hmm, talked about mm-hmm, him in, yeah. in this in this podcast studio today. So, like, that's what we're looking for. So the subjects we pick, we're not just looking for a quick, you know, beat down of facts and timelines. We're looking for something that lives and breathes yeah, yeah, and right, is entertaining. Right, so, right. you know, dude, we've covered, like, the Titanic story and White Star. We've covered the World War, uh, First World War. We've covered, you know, Civil War stuff. Um, we're getting ready to head to Crimea. Oh I yeah. Mean, get ready, folks. I mean, that's I mean, we'll say it now. Next we're gonna season. say it in a few minutes here when we sum up what's happening uh next season, but we're definitely heading to Crimea next year. Um, and then maybe even outer space. In one season, we're gonna go from Crimea to outer space, I think. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. That's how o- yeah. all over I got the board you. Okay. we are. Yeah. So, yeah. It is the history things podcast. Both right. Pat and I are military history nerds, but we wanted to try to have an inclusive show. Gotcha. Because there's so much more to history yeah. than just the military aspects. Yeah, okay, gotcha. I okay. mean, look, I love talking about war, but as you know, somebody that studies this all the time, sometimes it really, when you really do it, not in the quick Wikipedia watching documentaries research, when you really get into these personalized letters where you can absorb the emotions right. of the people, that exp- exactly. it, it will wear you down. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm following a soldier through the uh, First World War, Canadian Expeditionary Force soldier, and I'm following... In lieu of his his personal diary that doesn't exist or isn't known, he's the company unit. I'm sorry, the company history, another uh, company history that was written uh, that he's a part of. It's so sobering because there's so many quotes that talk about what these guys are experiencing by almost like a minute by minute basis. Yeah, that I'm worn out chapter to chapter. Like, I'm absolutely fried right. thinking about these guys slogging oh, yeah. up certain, not even just fighting, but just, like, walking from, like, post to post and stuff like that. So, yeah. um, I love that stuff. So, Dana, thank you yeah. so very hey, much. thank um, you to the History Things podcast for having me on. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. So, before we get out of here, let's actually jump back to History Net and all that for a few minutes. I did want oh. to ask. So, going back into... Um, what you do now, that's everything's got to start somewhere. Yeah. So I actually don't know that I'm directly asking about history net anymore, but that's what you do now. Yeah. But you started somewhere as a as a young history geek like all of us. We usually like to ask our guests their origin story. For a multitude of our guests, seemingly everybody but me, it starts with a trip to Gettysburg as a kid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, what is your or how did you your origin story? How did you become fascinated with the subject of history, U.S. history, whatever? Uh, well, my, my mom was a teacher who loved history and antiques kind of stuff. Cool. Nice. And so I grew up in a house. It was like a reproduction, like Cape Cod colonial house in Western Pennsylvania, uh, about an hour North of Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. And so, um, my mom would like read me history stuff at, at, you know, when I went to bed at night and, uh, when I was in um, second grade, my parents bought my cousin the American Heritage Illustrated History of the Civil War by Bruce Catton. You know the book yeah. I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. With I think a, I have it on the floor right down there. Um, yep. Yeah, I think that, yeah. So it's just like, and it's like... It's huge. <laughs> and it's, it's, uh, it's full of these hand-drawn maps of these little guys, the battles. Mm-hmm. That may not be the book that I'm thinking of, but it's similar, but they got it for my cousin and I found it and, um, the gift pile and I wore it out. I, I never gave it back. It was for him. And but so I, I just it. kept reading it and I was fascinated by it. And, um, you know, so my mom took it from me and she said, you're wearing out your cousin's book. 
<laughs> and so I was all bummed out and everything. So Christmas morning comes around. They went out and bought another book to give to my cousin because, you know what I mean, it was clean. <laughs> and they gave me the book that I had been reading. Nice. <laughs> and so, uh, and then that was it. And then my, my folks took me to... Um, Gettysburg, and I just, I lost my mind. Yeah, I just <laughs> lost my mind. And then my, in my high school, I had our excellent history teacher, and he actually had this little reenactment unit. It was French and Indian War. Oh, that's hey, neat. hey, that's my world. Because um, I was, a, uh, you know, because of where I grew up, you know, a lot of French and Indian War stuff, Fort Necessities around there, Fort Ligonier. Yeah. Right. And then um, we were horribly, if you're into reenacting, you know this word, Farby, yes. terrible. <laughs> we were like these terrible Farby high school kids, but we had so much fun. I'll date myself during the bicentennial because we did American eventually too. And that just cemented it all. And I just, you know, I've loved it ever since. I can't seem to get enough of the stuff. I mean, it's just I hear you. something I'm passionate about and... You know, I, you guys are considerably younger than I am, and it's great to see younger people. Well, I'll appreciate that. Matt's also very old like you are. Yeah, so I appreciate that, forget. Pat. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, well, Pat's a young spry. Yeah, you know. he's, he's one of these up-and-coming whippersnappers yeah. who feels that he can take the... Uh, yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's, <laughs> I, I know a lot of young people that are really interested in history yeah. and passionate about it. You guys make me feel so good. I'm and, uh, be on the other so side that was, of 35. That, that's my origin so story. <laughs> and it's like, my parents were so indulgent. They took me to reenactments when I, was, I couldn't drive. Mm -hmm. They took me to battlefields, Fredericksburg, Antietam, Gettysburg. Oh, bless them. That's and, awesome. um, you know, uh, I've lost them both, you know, for quite some time. And I think about them all the time. My mom, my dad would too, but my mom would just, like, lose her mind if she knew... They knew I was the editor of Civil War Times. They lived long to see that, long enough to see that happen. But if she knew that I was like giving tours at Gettysburg <laughs> and on podcasts and stuff, she would just lose her mind. They and know. so, yeah, that's cool. Brother. That's wonderful. I always love to to find out how people get into this because you know it's such a it's such an it's not a, it shouldn't be an obscure thing for people to become deeply passionate about. No. But it seems like it right, is right? right. You know, we love sports and we obnoxiously love politics right. and all these other right. things. Right. But like history, it's like, oh, it's so boring. It's like, well, that's because <sighs> X, Y or Z. But 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 like, you know, first of all, your parents did an amazing job keeping you engaged. But she's a teacher, right? Right. Like, she was a teacher. Sometimes yeah. it takes those right. special teachers mm -hmm. to change right. lives. And right. I think we're all fortunate that we've had them. But yeah. Um, how can people, and that guy just gets so upset when people say history is boring. I'm like, it's boring because too many civics teachers were, were, were football coaches in high school, right? Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Preach. And they, they, yeah. don't, they don't know how to make it come alive. History is people, man. This Erastus Tyler story is not boring. No. no. We say this all the time. Like, the reason people like to watch Game of Thrones is because there's essentially the sex, drugs, and rock and roll right. factor, right? Right. Yeah. History has all, yeah, all of those that. things. All of that. I mean, you can find all and of those things some. in some of the in single individuals. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I mean, Jesus. Yeah. Uh, not literally Jesus. We're not going to... Don't, send, not, us, don't, don't. send us the hate mail. Don't send us the I'll hate mail. I'll have to listen to that podcast. But, no. uh, but you know... <laughs> today we take apart Jesus. Yeah, you know what? There, if, uh, listen out there. It's coming. Uh, no, I just, coming. just... I was... I'm just joking. <laughs> we just lost our, our all no, of our all listeners our from the Bible just, Belt. If you think we have listeners from the Bible Belt at this point in season you, three, well, I, doesn't I, your agent say you just lost the Bible Belt? Thanks for hanging in there. This I can't believe yeah. you guys have toughed it out this long. I mean, Jesus, the again, Bible Belt literally. share just dropped through the floor. What are you guys doing? Yeah, yeah. not selling, not selling. Yeah. Well, um, so let's wind things down here, Matt. We are coming to the end of a huge season three. It was an honor and a privilege to once again host uh, this show here with you we've covered some amazing topics we started at the beach uh we ended in the city of baltimore it, wait when i say it like that it sounds like we went backwards i shouldn't say that <laughs> but you know we we did we started with the graveyard of the atlantic uh we went back into the beginnings of the american revolution we yep. we went to the lexington and concord battlefields the siege of boston uh, we went back to the western front we yes, got we, did. we got absolutely shelled along the somme uh, in July and August um, with British muzzleloaders. Rob Enfield did a great job with that, and now we're closing strong 
with our good friend Dana here. So what's coming up for us, Matt? Where are we going in quarter one in just a, a few short weeks for our listeners now? In just a few short weeks, we're going to have uh, Daryl Rivers on here. Lord, Lord Rivers. Rivers. Uh, who will be speaking to us about the Crimean War uh, and its ties to our own history. Uh, so we're really excited to talk about that uh, in quarter one of season four. We have lots of goodies Uh, Coming up for you in that season as well. We hope you've enjoyed some of the extra content you got uh, so far in season three, or I guess along the way in season three, our uh, our Maryland campaign videos were a blast to produce for you. We hope you enjoy the outtake video that we put out there just to show you that, you know, we're not always nerdy. Sometimes we're actually funny people, uh, stuff like that. So, uh, and uh, I just, let's just do a quick rundown shout out for all of our guests uh, here at the end of, actually, you know what? We got a whole end of year episode we're going to do. You guys, if you want to hear the shout outs, Tune in to the real preview of next season. It's just coming up, folks. Coming up, folks. Anyway, uh, we love you all. Thank you for listening to the History Things Podcast. You can follow us on our social medias uh, by searching at the History Things Podcast. Uh, You can follow me at History Things with Pat. You can follow Matt at Matt Borders Books. Um, That's it. That's all I got. For our guest today, Dana (laughs) Schoff, managing editor and print of History Net, the editor of the Civil War Times Magazine, my co-host, Matt Borders. I'm your co-host, Pat McGuire. Uh, Thank you all for listening. We will catch you all later. See you, folks. Thank you. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show.